Good morning. Good morning, Yisrael. We had three names, main names, the Jewish people. First, we're called Yaakov, which is Yud Ekev. We put wisdom, the Yud, the God letter, into the Ekev, the heel. Welcome. Even in the heel, it's recognized that Yaakov is Yaakov. Jacob is special. So Jacob confronts Esav. He's a warrior and is also known as Yisrael, which because it says the reason why you're called Israel, Kisarisa im Elokim ve'im Anashim v'Tuchal, you fought with angelic forces and and with men and you overcame. So you Sarisa, you're a fighter. You have Yaakov, who's starting with the heel, putting godliness even there. Then you have the warrior, the Jewish warrior, Israel. And then you have Yeshurun. We're not going to be called Yisrael anymore. We're going to be called Yeshurun. It's a name of kingship. The heel, Yaakov. Yisrael, the warrior, and Yishurun, welcome, the king. So I have a teaching here of Rabbi Rises, all about Mashiach, um, on, and it goes by Parsha. And um, he explains the reason why our name is going to change to Yishurun. Also, Yerushalayim is going to have a new name. Yeshurun sounds a bit like Yerushalayim, but Shlemus, Yerushalayim, Jerusalem is complete reverence. Yeshurun is more like upright, Yashar. So it says about Yerushalayim, the Kerelecha Shem Chadash, you will be given a new name, you will be called by a new name, Asher Pi Hashem Yekveno, that Hashem coins. Shem's going to give Yerushalayim a new name. But we know our future name is Yeshurun. So he explains the when Yisroel is no longer battling, Kisarisa, when you're no longer in, in conflict with the divine forces, Elohim, and Anashim with, with people, when you've totally completed that phase, the, the war phase, then you're expressive Yeshurun, you win um, the, the accomplished majestic name of peace. At that point, you would think that there is no more opportunity for merit because it's, it begins after the war, you settle the land. So when you when you settle the land, and you are in a redemptive state, there's no more opportunity. That's why the world to come is called the world of judgment, because everything's predetermined from that point on. The world of reward, there's no more opportunity for real transformation, because it's inherited. It's, it's automatic. The opportunity is when you have free choice. So the discussion turns to this, the debate of the sages about whether there's going to be mitzvahs in the future to come. And how could you fathom a time where there's no mitzvahs? The Rebbe has a, a lengthy sikha that explains what it means mitzvahs when you're commanded. There's going to be the will of Hashem, which is eternal. You can never get around the will of Hashem. Sometimes the will of Hashem is takes um, turns that you wouldn't expect and priorities are established and you see so many examples of seeming breaking of rules in the Tanakh when you when when the, the Torah always observes a great wisdom in, in any deviations. 
So sometimes you can, it's not so easy to see. When there's authentic sight and you see the truth of everything, it will be clear how Amek Kulam Siddiqim, there's going to be authentic behavior and everyone's going to be expressing their core identity as, as a Jew. So the entire time where we have a confrontation with ourselves is the time where there's free choice. And when Hashem kills the evil inclination, we will no longer have choice. So one way you could answer this, the idea of whether there's going to be mitzvahs or not, so if it's just the will of Hashem, that's something you do naturally, and you don't have to be commanded to do it anymore. Um, if so, there's no more opportunity for reward. So the distinction is made in terms of time, in the sense that there's two stages of redemption. One is called Yemes Mashiach, which sometimes includes its ultimate completion of the Elamatchia, the world of resurrection. So when see, when it's sometimes called Yemes Mashiach, and including that, then you have um, to understand things in light of that possibility of referring to the, the final stages. In the final stages, there not only will God have inspired the souls of the Jewish people, but the entire world would, would be reflected of um, the divine will. At that point, th that's descriptive of the El Matchia, the world of re the resurrection of the dead, where, when it's just a time of complete reward and um, no free choice at all because everything is that clear. There's a sort of obscure time, sometimes said to be 40 years, our sages teach, preceding the, the El Matchia, called the days of Mashiach, and you're going to have you're going to have a king ruling in the Holy Land, and other places it says that this king is going to have children. So the idea of 40 years. It even seems like there's going to be a coronation of his children, which implies um, it's just difficult to understand how that would happen because there's not going to be any death ultimately. Um, so in what sense is, is his continuity and his children um, relevant according to Allah? And, and that's difficult, especially if it's such a short period of 40 years. Um, be that as it may, the, the, usually you divide up the understanding of the oil matchia, the world of re the resurrection, as being the time of complete reward. And as Rambam writes, the Yemais Mashiach is actually a time where you can still build up merit for the ultimate reward of the world to come. So it's difficult to understand how you could have a state where um, there is opportunity for merit and it's a time of redemption. So that becomes the topic of this, this, this chapter, which is very well organized. I'm meandering a bit um, through it. Probably because I don't have time to go through it um, linearly. Now, how could therefore there be a time where you merit reward if there's already a state of redemption? You, so you're going to merit the reward in the time of Tchis Amazing. What constitutes the state of things that are going to be in the preceding time, in the, this, these 40 years, let's say, of the Yemais Mashiach preceding it, that allows you to get merit. There's going to be redemption, but there's going to um, be opportunity still. How could that be? So let me just read at least one paragraph. So there's a time where we said that Ruach HaTuma is going to be, the spirit of impurity is going to be 
swept away from the earth. Let's say that that applies to the final time, the world of Tchia. Then there will be the ultimate concealment of evil or demise of evil. We have another verse that refers to the purity of the Jewish people is not, the, the, the first one is the earth, the earth itself. That's the final stage when everything, including the environment, is purified. But it starts with the purity of the Jewish people. That's going to be a time where there is still going to be impurity possible in the world. But Hashem is going to cause it to pass away first from the of a Jew. We are somehow, and this is, ex- explains this a bit here, and we've seen this in Parshas um, Mishpatim in the winter, Chaf Zayin Shvat, my birthday, um, the Sicha, the final Sicha, one of the, I think the second last Sicha in the whole that we've had. Um, so it starts with a transparency in the heart of the Jew. Then the world follows. That constitutes the difference between the first stage when you have an illuminated people and then the, ultimately the world of Tchia when the world itself and of course the body of the Jew takes on an entire different um, significance in becoming the source of of the nourishing of the soul. So in the first stage, you you have the possibility for uh, the opportunity for merit, to bringing merit, for, to gaining the ultimate word of the world to come, of the, the world of Tchia. Because there's still going to be the possibility of evil in the world, but the person is going to be purified. How is that going to be welcome? Avram, how is the person going to be purified? It's usually about good thinking. We've learned yesterday, I think, that Pnei was the, the secret weapon of the Baal Shem Tov, to um, allow that to be the gateway through which the transformation takes place. Here, this is the impact of the good thinking on our minds and how that's going to um, be the means by which the, the, the Jew is purified. So the verse says, Yitan lechol Yehudi, lev chadash lev basar. You're going to get a new heart, a heart of flesh, as opposed to the heart of stone. Hu yaske lib chen kol davr la mitoy. A person will be able to clear, be, see clearly and determine the true state of everything. Betsura Shakula, in a way that's measured and accurate, defined. In the vast majority of instances, if you see clearly, you're going to do the right thing. Because that's what obligates healthy thinking. So here you're going to have the cure for exile, healthy thinking. And that is going to be the means by which the Ruach Shtus, the spirit of folly, bad thinking, bad upbringings, trauma, the heart of stone is melted. Okay, I'm just giving you a taste. I mean, quite a bit more that attention this needs. I'm just thinking whether I finished that part about Sar Kel. It's the question of whether you have to, the, the, the combat of, of Yisrael, of Israel, when it's, um, one, the Yeshua and the state of Yeshua and the new name is going to be one that you don't have to force yourself anymore 
you're driven towards the right thing. How's that going to happen? Here we say it starts with the heart. Hashem is going to give us a new heart, a heart of flesh, meaning that our minds are going to see clearly how the correct response, the genuine, godly response to things is going to become obvious and clear. Have a good day.